Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Randy Turner. I'm the Accessibility and Disability Policy uh, Coordinator here at the Governor's Committee on People with Disabilities. Today, we're going to have with us Marsha Gudo. Did I get, I didn't get it. <laughs> I can never pronounce her name. I'll let Marsha introduce herself momentarily. Uh, we are recording the session, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Marsha. Thank you, Marsha, for joining us today. Thank you, and good morning. It's Marsha Godo, like Frodo, even though my husband hates that I've referred to it that way, but it's easier way to remember. Um, I work with the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation in the Elimination of Architectural Barriers Program. I've worked there for about 13 years and currently am the program manager for our program under the regulatory program management division. So we'll go to the next slide. The goal of this webinar is to provide sufficient knowledge to be able to tell the difference between federal accessibility requirements and state accessibility requirements. You will end up being comfortable filing complaints of accessibility requirements with TDLR, as well as know the steps to verify your construction project is accessible. And then lastly, we'll discuss some of the upcoming changes to the Texas accessibility standards. Let's start with an introduction to the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation, or TDLR. TDLR is commonly known as the umbrella agency because we regulate almost 40 different programs. Uh, as a little history lesson, TDLR started as the Bureau of Labor Statistics in 1909. The mission of the Bureau was to collect and report statistical information to the governor regarding labor and industry within the state of Texas. Over time, the Bureau's responsibilities increased to administration and enforcement of law impacting the health and safety of employees, employers, and the public. In 1973, the agency got a name change to the Department of Labor and Standards. At that point, it had about six programs that we regulated. And then in 1989, we became the Texas Department of Licensing and Regulation. As I mentioned, we regulate 38 different programs of many different types. One of our largest programs is the Barber and Cosmetology licensees with a current total of 377,810 licensees. We also have unique programs of a smaller nature, such as weather modification and all the different types in between. There are several buildings and mechanical programs under TDLR, such as elevators, boilers, and the architectural barriers program that I work with. The agency has several responsibilities to ensure the public are safe. Our licensing division works to issue licenses for those that qualify and renew licenses to make sure uh, they make sure that all continuing education requirements are met. Our enforcement division receives and investigates complaints that we'll talk about a little bit later. And the regulatory program management division audits licensees to ensure that they are all following the established rules and standards when performing work such as plan reviews and inspections. Now on to accessibility. One of the most common questions we get is how do I make my place ADA accessible? While the Texas Accessibility Standards, or TAS, and the American with Disabilities Act Accessibility Guidelines, or ADAG, are similar, there are some significant differences between the two. First, and possibly the most important difference, is that TAS is regulated by Chapter 469 of the State Government Code. This is a construction law that requires new construction, renovations, or alterations to a facility building or site to trigger accessibility requirements, as opposed to the ADA law, which is a regulation of Title I, Title II, and Title III. These are civil rights laws, meaning that everyone that uses the facility has the same rights. So if the facility is operational, it must be accessible to all. So 
Starting way back in 1970, publicly owned facilities such as city halls, public libraries, public schools, and state parks were required to be constructed as accessible to users. This covered any facilities that tax dollars paid for. Yes, even the Capitol and the governor's mansion are covered under the Texas Administrative Code 68.20a. At the same time, 68.20b started requiring that all public facilities constructed under a temporary or emergency basis will be accessible as well. While the short-term facilities are a little harder for us to catch for compliance, there are several instances where temporary isn't a loose term. Think about not long ago when a good portion of the coastal cities of Texas were flooded from Hurricane Harvey. Any of those town halls or city council facilities moved so to continue providing services were required to be accessible at the time they moved. To make sure that we're catching all public facilities were covered in 1972, state lease facilities were added to Rule 6820. This is the only section within Chapter 68 where construction is not required to make the facility subject. The requirement here is if the contract between the facility owner and the Texas Facilities Commission is for an annual amount of $12,000 or more a year, the facility must be accessible with the minimum requirements. In 1992, Texas set its sights on facilities beyond the public to also include facilities of public accommodation. These are privately owned. They include transient lodging, so hotels, facilities that are consum for consumption of food or drink, places of exhibition or entertainment, public gatherings, places of sales, service establishments like laundromats, public transportation facilities, places of recreation, places of display, social service establishments, and places for exercise or recreation. To round things out, the last two types of facilities were added. Commercial facilities, are those that affect commerce and they're typically focused on employee work areas. An example of this would be an Amazon warehouse. Last are religious organizations. These differ, this is different from federal requirements that are exempted in full um, from the federal requirements. TAS only exempts areas that are used strictly for religious rituals. So the kitchens, daycares, toilet rooms, and all of those areas must be accessible to these facilities. I have a question. Yes. Um, hang on just a second. Because, okay, we have a, a question that's come from the audience, but I had a question too, because religious stuff comes up on occasion here. Mm -hmm. We get questions about, um, like you just said, what parts are required to be accessible. And so <clears throat> I think the big difference here is that you've told me often is the Texas accessibility standards is a building code. It yes. is not about civil right access to, I guess, in, in so many other ways like communication access for people with vision loss or with hearing loss. Um, so when it comes to um, places that are, covered could you give us some more examples like the parking lot would the parking lot be something that because we get that's probably the biggest questions we get is about accessible parking would that be something that would have to fall under the texas accessibility standards yes parking is you, when you do construction to a parking lot it is considered construction so full paving would be considered construction now uh task law does have where if you do maintenance so if you're just fixing a pothole or two in your parking lot, um, that would be considered maintenance. It wouldn't be considered as construction per se. It's just regular maintenance. Okay. Um, but if you're if you're redoing your whole parking lot, taking it from a grass lot and making it paved, that's going to be considered construction, and it would be subject. Okay. <clears throat> um, TAS, this is a comment from Jim, TAS versus the ADA. Don't forget that residentials receiving federal funding, uh, collegiate housing, dorms, and schools are subject to ADA. Uh, clarify Texas accessibility standards and ADA applicability for these other occupancies. Okay, 
So there is a set of exempted areas for tasks. We, uh, we don't cover federal property. We let the feds handle their own stuff. Um, so like a post office would not be required to comply with tasks. Uh, another exemption is public garages or parking garages that are built prior to 19, I believe it's 94 off the top of my head. Uh, don't have to have specifically the van accessible spaces. Uh, our rules also exempt residential. So meaning townhomes, condos, private residences, the apartment complex that is strictly the residential part, those are all exempted from tax compliance. So if they have federal money and have to comply with ADA, that's all covered on, under that requirement and it's exempted from tax. So the only part that we would look at at an apartment complex that uses federal money would be the public accommodation portion. So the leasing space. So that answered another question. If the, if the TAS applies to apartments or would it just be fair housing? Or could it be both kind of depending? It, it depends on the, the scope of work. Um, we, we always look at the cons what construction was done and what's being provided. Okay. So, and we'll go over examples here in a few minutes. And another question about religious facility. What about religious facilities that allow their facilities to be used by the general public, such as a gymnasium? A gymnasium used by the general public. So the only exemption from TAS is if it is a area that is for a religious organization. So they have to be tax, tax breaks and they have to be filed as a religious organization, not private entities. And it, the exemption in TAS is only for areas of religious ritual. So a gymnasium would not be counted as a religious ritual area. It would have to comply with TAS. Okay. Um, and somewhere, I guess, in here, uh, individual caught that you said accessibility to all define all in a hospital bed. A hospital would be a service establishment and would be required to comply. But the bed is a whole different issue. That might be an ADA accommodation or modification, but that would not have anything to do with the building code. Right. A, a bed would not be a constructed element. And so it would not have to comply with tasks necessarily. What about mobile home community trailer park? A mobile home community trailer park. Uh, so the, the homes themselves would be exempted from TAS. Now in hindsight, I probably should have listed a slide with the exemptions. Um. <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna cover some of this, I don't know if you can see the Q&A questions coming up. One is asking for a point of contact. We'll get, we'll get that. For we will get the point of contact. But so uh, the um. home itself would be exempted, but if, it is a public accommodation, so um, privately owned, public place, not used strictly for residents and their guests. Uh, those that park itself could have some areas that are subject to tax. Okay. Voting locations? Voting locations, yeah, most of those are at public facilities, so that's covered way back in the 1970s. What but if they're the temporary stuff, you yeah. have to have construction. Okay. Okay. Um, Keep going. Well, we have a couple of more questions. Okay. And you wanted to take them during the session. Sure, sure. Uh, yeah. Please clarify further when the new signage regulations and markings. We'll talk about accessible parking later, right? Yes, we'll we'll talk about we, where that's going to. I think we can move on from here. All right. Okay. Okay. So, how does the state of Texas regulate this? Well, all those facilities we just talked about are required to comply when construction or at the start of a state lease in those situations. We add the requirements of a project registration, plan review, and inspection if a project has a total construction cost of $50,000 or more thereby helping to catch any possible violations before construction or just after construction is completed. In addition, TDLR can receive complaints from anyone. This is slightly different than a complaint that goes to the Federal Department of Justice that end up more focused on lawsuits of Title I, II, and III. 
As I mentioned, the subject facilities are required to comply to be compliant with the Texas accessibility standards at the time of construction. Uh, but if construction costs comes to $50,000 or more, it's, it is required to be registered with TDLR and get a plan review and inspection by a registered accessibility specialist or a RAS. The cost includes everything associated with the construction of the project except site acquisition, so the purchase of the land, consulting fees, your fees you pay your designer, or furniture, that's any, that, that would be that hospital bed, and equipment that's not part of the mechanical, electrical, or plumbing system. So let's go over some common examples that come to TDLR. A uh, retail strip mall, they're getting a new tenant to move in. Construction cost is $500,000. Is the project required to be registered? First, we look at, uh, we look, are they doing construction? Yes. Then, then is the facility on the 68.20 list? As a place of sales, it's on the list as a public accommodation. So it's a subject facility, it is required to be accessible. Last, what we ask is, what is the construction cost? Over $50,000? Yes, it must be registered, reviewed, and inspected for compliance. Okay, next example, store warehouse, installation of racking. Um, is that construction? Yes, affixing the racking increases the storage and it's considered construction. You got the screwdriver out, putting it in you're doing construction. A store warehouse is a commercial facility that affects commerce, so the facility is required to be task compliant. Now, on this one, the construction cost is less than $50,000, so it would not be required to be registered or have a plan review or inspection. Now we have a church project. Are they performing construction? Yes, an update to the facility would be considered construction. Remember that this facility would be exempted in full by ADA requirements, but not by tax. So it, is a, so it is a subject facility, even though the baptistry is an area of religious ritual and exempted. The construction cost is over 50,000, is under $50,000. So even though the foyer and daycare areas would be required to be accessible, they would not be required to be registered the project or have a plan review or inspection. Okay, different church down the road, they're paving their parking lot and got a great deal of $60,000. Paving the lot, even if existing lot is considered construction as we talked about. We have already said the church is a subject facility and with a cost of $60,000, it would be required to be registered, reviewed and inspected. So, what should you expect in a plan review or inspection when they're required? The requirement of a plan review is that it to be completed prior to inspection. However, it's more advantageous if it's completed prior to the start of construction. By law, it's the responsibility of the current facility owner to make sure that this plan review is completed. The RAS will review the documents and pro provide by uh, the documents provided by owner or designer. I should mention that there's no requirement that the construction documents must be by a registered designer, but if they are, the designer must provide the drawings of the RAS within 20 days of issue date. So once the plan review is completed, the RAS will notify the owner of any findings or concerns. Say our parking lot example, didn't notate the van accessible signage is being provided. The RAS report will let the owner know where the possible violation is located, the accessible parking for example, from our example, and what portions of TAS trigger compliance requirements, so TAS 502. Once the construction is completed, the RAS can come out and inspect the project. The owner by law has up to one year from the completion of construction to get the RAS out to the site for the inspection. But it's highly recommended that the inspection occur as soon as the construction is completed because you got your contractors on hand right then. If the RAS finds any violations, they will issue a report to the owner where the violations are located and what portions of task trigger compliance requirements, similar to a plan review. If that accessible parking is still doesn't have the proper signage, it has to be noted within the inspection report. Okay, several questions, several questions have popped up. <laughs> okay. 
I'm going to start at the bottom because I'm, I'm losing track. There's so many. Uh, do you look at the actual cost or the fair market value? We look at the cost submitted. So it's going to be what, what they, they estimate it's going to cost when they register. And then if it changes, they have to provide the, what it actually costs. So your, your bills. How was one year period determined? How was the one year period determined to get the inspection done? I don't know. That predates me. Maybe we can find out. Maybe. We'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does the construction cost apply to public civil projects such as water line? that might have some sidewalk components. Is the cost total used or just sidewalk components? Oh, y'all are on it today. <laughs> okay, so public uh, right-of-way projects do get a little bit of a, a leniency. In the rules, it states that you only have to go and use the cost of the um, public pedestrian elements. So if you've got a big old TxDOT street project, and it's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, um, you're only gonna go and use the cost for the sidewalks and the pedestrian elements, the crosswalks, the ped buttons and things like that. Okay. That is a small rule out there that I apparently needed to put in the presentation. Um, if, the, if a public park has several picnic table areas with sheds, do we need to have accessibility of, to all of them or only a percentage of the total? So a public park, um, if, if, you're, if you've got built facilities, so your shed and your, your, your tables are bolted down, um, that's going to be counted as a public accommodation and you have to have an accessible route to each accessible element. Uh, currently, there are no requirements that you provide an accessible route to benches within um, a park, but if you hold on, we'll talk about that here at the end of the presentation. What about training schools or small vocational schools? Uh, training schools or small vocational schools are on the list. They are places of education if they are privately owned or if they use uh, if they are publicly owned, such like a, a regular, uh, you know, I'm a, I live in Hutto, so Hutto ISD has a training school. Uh, that's a public space, so those are subject. Um, in the store warehouse area, I think this was one of the previous uh, questions or the examples you provided. Um, are only, let's see, in the store warehouse area only allows employees, would it be considered an employee work area? Yes, yes. A warehouse, typically all those commercial facilities, the, the employee work area is the minimum requirement. So um, within TAS, there is an exception that says you only have to have, provide the minimum approach, enter, and exit to each employee work area. So at a minimum, you would have to be able to get to each of those warehouse rooms. Or if you've got the office way in the back, you got to be able to get through that warehouse to the office. So right. that, that office also has a approach, enter, and exit. When is the deadline for project registration? Before the construction is completed or, or when? A project can be registered at any time. However, if it is registered after it's completed, there is an additional charge. So typically registration is $175. And then if I finished my project yesterday and just registered it today, I'm gonna to have to pay $300. Okay. Um, in the retail example, how does this differ if the tenant is, or landlord is paying for the work? <laughs> like y'all are on it. Uh, so there is an exception within TAS about tenant funding. So it is still subject. It's still required to get registered, reviewed, and inspected. But all they're going to go and look at in the tenant funding project, tenant funded project, are the parts that the tenant has authority over. So in the space. So it, it uses the, the tenant funding exception uses the idea that when the facility as a whole was built it was built properly and, and accessible so the parking and the sidewalks and things like that were already accessible but they want to check the spaces inside the tenant space okay there are two exits on the site to the public walkway one site is sloped and different to build a an ada ramp 
do the do both exits require to comply with TAS? TAS only requires one accessible route to the public way. Okay. And there was something else before too about, and they're asking if it's not fixed storage. So you gave an example earlier. Right. So we screwed in the racking. If you just put it into the, the warehouse and you're not screwing it in, you're not doing construction. Um, the common idea is, is if you take a building and you flip it over, anything that falls out is not constructed and it's not fixed. Okay. Um, for the most part, that, that theory works. And what happens if the initial project is under 50,000 and then the, there's a change order that puts it over? And that happens a lot. Um, so what they do is you register the project as soon as you find out that it's, it's going to go over, which could be a late registration. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go on. We have a few more questions. We'll hold those till the end. I want to make sure you get through the rest of your, your stuff okay. here. Okay. So should there be construction to a subject facility and some items were constructed in violation with the Texas accessibility standards, anyone can notify TDLR of such issues. Our website has a quick link at the top of the page that anyone can file a complaint and complaints can be anonymous. However, should there be questions, filing with, the, with contact information is recommended. Every complaint received is reviewed by our intake team with our enforcement division. They will review the location and ask the same questions we've asked in our examples. So did construction occur to trigger task compliance? Is the facility a subject facility? If the answer to these two questions is yes, the complaint will move on to our investigator team. Now keep in mind that even if you found the facilities were not subject to task compliance because one of those questions came up, no, the facility still uh, could be required to comply with the ADA requirements on the civil side. So complaints can be filed there. Also notice we didn't talk about the project cost question when we're talking about complaints. Um, to determine if compliance is required because facilities, uh, because a facility constructed under $50,000 is still required to comply regardless of cost if it's a subject facility. The investigator team will then contact the owner to verify the exact work that was performed, when and what compliance was required at the time of construction. They'll consult with the regulatory program division on task requirements. Then once all the Sorry, lost my spot. <laughs> Once all the items are researched and verified, a prosecutor will work with the owner regarding getting construction corrections made. Prosecutors can assess up to $5,000 per day per violation. A registered accessibility specialist or RAS is an individual that is certified by the department to perform review or inspection functions of the department, meaning they're licensed by TDLR, but they're not considered employees of TDLR. To get a license, they must file with TDLR through the application process with a resume reflecting the number of years experience they have in the construction field or reviewing plans or inspecting buildings. Once the application has been reviewed by TDLR, we'll, we'll notify you, the individual, they're eligible to take the test. It's a two hour open book test, meaning you can bring a copy of tasks in to the test. And it has 60 questions. Once they've passed their test, a RAS receives their license. They have an annual renewal, an annual renewal, and have to take a minimum of eight hours of continuing education courses, four of those being TDLR approved providers. They are free to set their own fees for plan review and or inspections and can also perform consulting services such as assistance with variance requests or compliance surveys of facilities. Currently we have about 500 licensed RASs, but only about half of those are active with use, actively use their license. To put it into perspective, there's an average of 2000 projects registered with TDLR every month. That's two, 24,000 a year, meaning that there's more than enough work out there for anyone that would be want to be a RAS. I've referenced several times the this morning chapters 469 and chapter 68. These are foundations of our requirements. 
chapter 469 are state laws that are passed by the state legislation. 469 specifies the application of the standards, how TVLR is charged with administering and enforcement of such standards. It sets up our advisory committee uh, requirements and responsibilities. It allows TVLR to assess penalties for violations and the requirements of a plan review and inspection for projects with a construction cost of $50,000 or more, as well as specifies when TVLR and only TVLR can allow for waivers from those standards. The Texas Administrative Code 68 are where we refer to what we refer to as our rules. These are drafted and updated by TDLR. It provides greater detail to the law requirements. This is where you find the specific facilities that are subject to compliance and a few that are not. <laughs> it goes into detail about the requirements for submission construction documents and deadlines for plan reviews and inspections. The RAS responsibilities are listed in the rules as well as what they cannot do, such as provide work when it's a conflict of interest. And the rules are also where any fees or penalties that TDLR will charge can be found. Like all the programs under TDLR umbrella, the Elimination of Architectural Barriers program is required to have an advisory commission or board. The AB advisory board consists of nine total members with the majority required to be persons with disabilities. They serve three-year terms, and currently we have two openings for those that are interested. You can get to the application on our program website. The application process is the last option under the advisory committee heading on the right side of the page. The board assists the program by reviewing the pro provided insights from the public point of view or any proposed on any proposed rule changes, procedures, and any drafted technical memorandum issued by the department. We have an agency commission, and it's a group of seven members that have been appointed by the governor. They serve six-year terms, and the commission has the authority to approve any proposed rule changes or task updates presented to them. One of the biggest items coming down the pipe for TDLR's AB program is the work we are doing to update the 2012 TAS to a 2022 version. It's been 10 years since our last update to the requirements in the Texas Accessibility Standards when many other building codes update on a regular basis. Also, there have been several additions to the Texas Administrative Code that are more accessibility regulations than they are rules. Because they're located in TDLR rules, they frequently get missed, as well as techni any technical memorandums that TDLR has issued. So we believe that by locating the requirements into one location, the 2022 TAS, it will provide better accessibility for Texas. Lastly, there have been many technological advances over the years, and before they get constructed with no accessibility, TDLR is being proactive in putting the requirements in, uh, of accessibility in the 2022 TAS. So what are we actually putting in the 22 TAS? The technical requirements of Chapter 68103 for detention and correctional facilities and Chapter 68104 for accessible parking, they'll be put in the 2022 TAS. In addition, Chapter 68102, the references requirements of federally proposed public right-of-way guidelines the portions of those proposed guidelines they're going to, that are more strict than the current task requirements will be added into the 2022 task. Any technical memorandums that, are, that we have issued uh, for clarification purposes that could be added as requirements have been added into the 2022 task proposal. In the same vein, we have added more definitions and clarifications for items that TDLR and RAS has received common questions on or items that seem confusing. We've also moved several of the items that appear on the op as optional requirements because they were in sections called advisory um, that we're going to add it into the actual requirement text to remove confusion. Technological advances such as electrical vehicle charging stations were added into the proposal as a proactive approach to growing need. Lastly, we added a new chapter in TAS that mirrors the federally proposed outdoor guidelines. 
This will put state requirements areas such as trails, camps, sites, uh, picnic areas, and those into the 2022 test. So what is the process for updating tasks? Our process started with, with compiling the items we wanted to change for the 2022 tasks. The regulatory program management team then took the drafted document to the office of the governor to let them know our proposal and ideas. This is where we are currently in the process. Uh, once approved, we will post the draft to the public for their idea and comments. At the same time, the proposed rule changes based on updated to the 2022 tasks will be posted to the state registry as required by law. This is to notify the public officially of any rule changes associated with the update. After 30 days of public comment, TDLR will meet with the advisory and some other stakeholders to help research matters that were brought up. This stage will take longest as it will require time to verify that any updates of the 2022 tasks do not violate federal accessibility requirements for hopefully a future equivalent certification from the Department of Justice, like we did uh, back in 1994 tasks. Once a final document is drafted, it will be brought to the Program Advisory Board for review. And then the final stop will be the Department's Commission for final approval. Okay, I'm available to take more questions. And if you have, if you think of some later, you could, we have provided the TDLR contact information as well. Yes, we have quite a few. Um, <laughs> you can see the questions if you want to take a look um, okay. and answer what you want, or I can just read them out to you. Go ahead and read um, them out. Okay. Um, somebody did ask about CEUs. We did not apply for any CEUs, so I don't know if there's a after the fact way that they can be granted, but you will get an email that confirms your attendance if you need to proof of, of that. Um, okay, please clarify again about the new signage regulations and markings that are required for accessible parking. Currently, it is in our statute and rule that um, the accessible parking must have the wheelchair Charlie symbol on the paved um, accessible parking space, as well as the words no parking within the associated access aisle. And then they also state that they have to have some sort of towing enforcement signage. So uh, located underneath the signage for uh, that, that states the accessible signs. Um. TAS applies to construction with $50,000 or more. Would that include labor performed by staff, which is paid through internal cost or by volunteers rather than external payment? If so, how is that calculated? All right, we're gonna start off that, that statement. It is task compliance is required for subject facilities regardless of construction costs. So the second part of that question would be if you've got, if you're using volunteers to go and pay. Um, it, it sounds like that would volunteer hours. If you're not paying them, I wouldn't count that towards your construction cost. Um, it would be for your, your, your building elements and the cost to go and get the materials. It sounds like that would be all of your cost. All right. If the owner has one year, why is a form AB041N requiring 30 days? So they have one year because there are only 500 RASs available for the full state of Texas and there is more projects than they can get to within 30 days. As I said, I would recommend the sooner you get them out, the better. Um, it allows, the, the one year allows for time uh, in case construction gets delayed. Um, although you should be updating your RAS or TDLR with any changes to your construction date so that you do have the full year. Uh, that, that would be my best explanation on okay. that. Okay, and again, you've got her email. You can always email um, to reach Marsha and she can answer any additional questions we may not get to. I, let's see, what about things like sidewalks or parking at an apartment complex? For example, if a curb or 
cut wheelchair ramp, a curb cut wheelchair ramp was not built with the new sidewalk for all residents to use. Does, does TAS cover that? So again, an apartment complex, the residential areas or areas used strictly for residents and their guests would be exempted from TAS compliance. Um, areas of public accommodation. So the, the sidewalk get to the leasing office, um, the parking for the leasing office, things like that, those would all be required to comply. And in regards to Fair Housing Act, there may be a reasonable accommodation request from a, a resident to have a curb cut accessible place established for them. That is a reasonable accommodation under HUD, HUD, HUD and DOJ guidance. Yes, um, we, we frequently send people to Fair Housing and, and HUD. Often you can get that that way. Mm -hmm. When we use the issue certificate of occupancy to begin the one year timeline, but agree that sooner the better to have the RAS inspect the site. Does systems furniture in an office space, which can be considered portable and not fixed, need to comply with accessible clearances? So actually systems furniture is listed in the Texas Accessibility Standards as a, a required compliant piece of furniture. Um, usually it, it's fixed with electrical work um, that comes down from the ceiling and, and affixes the, the system. And so it is a subject employee work area most of the time, by the way. Uh, so it's got the minimum requirements of approach enter and exit. Okay. How does TDLR handle a complaint on a registered project because the records retention policy has already purged the associated project plans from TDLR's files? That's a good question. So if you see that a project is constructed, filed a complaint where our investigators are looking at it, we're gonna contact the owner and find out when exactly it was built. If it is beyond our records retention and we can't find that information when the investigator asks the regulatory program, management team um, will ask that information from the owner. And if, if it's something we can't prove more than likely, we will just make them correct it because we're going to err on the side of accessibility. Okay. When is the next test being offered for the RAS licensing? So RAS licensing tests, you, you, once you get confirmation that you're allowed to take the test and your application is approved, you will contact uh, a third party and, and we'll tell you when we give you the little okay to take the test, uh, who to contact. And I can't think of it off the top of my head because I wasn't expecting that question. Oh. They can email you. Email me. <laughs> we'll get you that information. It's also on our website. How much does the initial certification cost and how much is the renewal fee per year? For a RAS license, oh, wasn't expecting that one either. Hold on one second. I think it's $300 for a RAS license. While you're looking that up, I can go ahead and read the next one. It's kind of yes. Nice. Can you describe how long it takes from the time a complaint is filed and to issue resolution? Are all complaints investigated? How long does it usually take between a complaint being filed and an investigation commencing? How is the complaint complainant included in subsequent communications about an investigation or resolution? Okay, all right. Quick answer to the last one, it's $300 for registration, 250 for renewal, and it is a company called PSI that does the testing. And you can go to their website, which is psiexams.com. Okay, complaint, it, it, I can't tell you how long it takes because it honestly depends on what kind of information we get and what kind of information the owner provides and, and how much time it takes to research items and how big the problems are. So a lot of times we'll get a complaint, we'll, we'll find out it is valid, it's something that should be task compliant and we will talk to the owner and we'll have them send us pictures, 
if possible, we try and get them to correct the violations this right then and there. Um, and we'll give them deadlines and we'll work with them. And then the prosecutor will go in and determine fees and fines and things like that. That's the best case scenario. Those are the quickest. Uh, the longer ones, we receive And when you one, say quick and long, like how, what is quick? Is it a month? Is it three months? Is it six months? Or Because it's not my division, I don't want to go and say exactly okay. how long. Um, I know that when I'm talking to them, a quick one is a month. Okay. So that's my little tiny portion. Gotcha. Um, a long one when I was involved in my portion uh, with just the investigator and trying to figure that out, it was a couple of years, but that one was because it was a whole complex and there was a list of like a hundred violations on that complex. And how is the complainant included in the communications about the complainant. So if you provide your, your contact information, we will notify you of the steps saying, okay, yes, our intake department has seen it. We appreciate this. We're going to move it forward. Okay. Now the investigators have looked at it. Thank you so much again. And then they'll, they'll let it know when it's closed at that point. If, if it's one of those quick ones. Um, is there such a thing as over compliance with tasks, specifically accessible parking space, locations that unduly possibly inconvenience non-disabled facility users? I am of the opinion of no, there is not such a thing as over accessibility. Uh, but if they are going above and beyond and providing more and some of those ten happen to be in violation, unfortunately, we're going to make it you can't remove there is a requirement in tasks that you cannot reduce accessibility um so providing more you're going to have to make those accessible if you provide them must comply is a common phrase we use so uh -huh. be wary okay okay how is tdlr making the regulation regulated community aware of their responsibility to comply I found school districts often have projects 50,000 or so taking place, but do not register with TDLR. This is especially true when donated funds from parent or community groups are used to initiate the project. Those sound complaint worthy, and I encourage you to file complaints. There is a a, a requirement for municipalities when they if they cannot issue a permit for construction if they find a, a project is over $50,000. So if it's required to be registered, reviewed and inspected, the municipality should not be issuing permits for those buildings unless they verify it's been registered at a minimum. Um, we are working with uh, creating training modules for several municipalities to make sure that they start enforcing that a little bit more regularly. Uh, otherwise, trainings like this one, just getting the word out how to file a complaint and, and where it's located. All right, Ron, um, our executive director has a question. He has his hand raised. Yeah, I realized when you're a panelist, you can't type a question in the Q&A box. Right. Uh, <laughs> how do the revision of your rules contemplate uh, coverage of adult changing tables, which uh, are uh, being covered in revisions to the International Building Code? So adult changing tables is one of those technological advances or situations given the current state of things um, that we have added into our proposal for um, if, if they provide it based off of those, those alternate building codes, then right now in the proposal, it, it gives requirements for uh, clear floor space and operable parts and things like that. So they'll be covered if they're provided, but they won't be required to be provided, correct? Currently, yes, that is correct. Okay, thank you. What code is chapter 469? Where is that located? Under what code? Chapter 469 is the elimination of architectural barriers, government code. Um, you can find it on the statutes.capital. Okay. Marcia, if I can jump in. Yes. This is Jessica Tavar, Department of Licensing and Regulation. 
Chapter 469 is actually in the um, occupation tab. And I will post the link for you guys. In a neighborhood, does an HOA have to provide ramps or sidewalks or group mailbox areas? So a neighborhood is a tricky one. It, it starts, typically they start out as private, uh, uh, private facilities. Then typically they claim that all those areas are for residents and their guests only, meaning that they meet um, the exception for residential areas. However, they end up then going, becoming a public accommodation when they are deeded over to a public entity like the city. Because there's no construction done between those two phases, um, they get exempted a lot. My recommendation when I talk to municipalities is never take, take the deed over until you know that it's successful because at the point when you go and do some construction to go and add to those sidewalks or those parks or something like that, then you're going to have to go and be accessible at that point because you're doing a construction to a public accommodation. Uh, we lean heavily on those kinds of things for ADA because it, they, they met a loophole. Uh, will the 2022 uh, TAS be incorporating accessibility requirements found in the 27th edition of ICC A117.1 that will be utilized for the, with the 2021 edition of the IBC? So that is on our list to research to see if we can update all of our uh, reference standards. Anyone who has seen the 2012 TAS knows that some of those reference standards are pretty old. Um, but our biggest challenge is going to make be making sure that the, the newer standards, the newer referenced standards do not violate the ADA because we really don't want to go in and contradict what they already have out there uh, for accessibility. Okay. Another related question, and maybe you just answered it, because I don't know what all these numbers in the IBC is. <laughs> How does the TAS line up with the ICC A117.1 standards for accessible and usable buildings? Again, it's going to be the same answer. Okay. We will make sure to the best of our ability that we can update as much as we can. Um, is that... 2022 TAS online to review for individuals to review yet? The 2022 TAS is not online yet. We are hoping soon in the next couple of weeks. We've, um, we are just waiting for the, the blessing right now. Where would people look to find that? Just go to your, the, your area of the website? They can, they, when we get, when we post it, there will be a link on our website for the location. Um, we will also put it into our listserv or our, our, our email blast for anyone who's signed up. So you, for this website, you'll go to license types and then elimination of architectural barriers. And this is everything you ever want to know about our program. It'll be there on the news feed um, down underneath sign up for email updates. You can also sign up for email updates there and you'll, you'll get an email as soon as we post it. Is that at the bottom of the page? No, back up at the top. I missed it. That's okay. okay. We'll just leave it right, oh, right. So it'll be right up in this area. So the, the sign up for email updates there in the middle of the screen is where you'll get, you could sign up for our email blasts. Okay. And then the news feed starts right after that. Then uh, I think we have time for one or two more questions. No, it's right at 11 o'clock. I'm going to ask one more question. Will there be any items that will be grandfathered in? Oh, we don't like the term grandfathered. It's misleading. Um, we, a lot of the standards will stay the same. Like I said, we don't want to violate the ADA, um, but it will all be based off of, because we're at construction law. So every, when 2022 task starts, it'll say at this point, any building constructed from this point forward has to follow the 2022 standards. Anything pr construction prior would have to follow the 2012 standards. Okay, and I'm going. I'm just typing in the chat box here that we will get um, the answers to the questions we didn't get to. 
um, there were a lot more than I think you realized or thought were going to be. We thought she was going to have all this extra time. So we did have some though, and we got to quite a few questions, I think, with a lot of different topics. So thank you everyone for uh, attending and, and please post any other questions in that Q&A box real quick and we'll make sure and get answers for you. Thank you, Marsha, for joining us. I want to thank uh, the interpreter and um, the rest of you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. I'm going to um, save the chat. Bye-bye.